with uh, two of them are in this room. Um, uh, I've been able to help get them funded through um, a number of grants uh, through the brand of Panton. And I'm going to, uh, you know Ross and Jenny, I'm going to talk about Sophie uh, towards the end of my talk. So OpenCon Washington uh, really, I think, showed a huge amount of talent, excitement, and I think pent up anger uh, among students from across the world. Uh, and I'm going to take the third one here, um, Open Access Buffing, the most important OA development in recent years. And I believe that because I think OA Button is the first time that people started really doing something about open access rather than talking and politicking about it. I also think it could be valuable to change the words open access because Audrey Watters showed us that it had been open. In other words, it's meaningless. Open access does not mean anything. I think you need to find, I'm going to say you sometimes, but I would like to count myself in that you as we. Um, open is about justice and freedom. That is the key thing uh, that you should take forward. The Budapest uh, Declaration of Open Access is a wonderful document. It was written, uh, I think, mainly by Peter Suber. It takes much of it from the founding fathers of the US. Uh, and the language here is just superb. Uh, and uh, if we take the, uh, the second paragraph, it is not just about us as academics in the university system. It's about everybody. And the words curious minds show that. Now, we have not got anywhere near that. Go out in the street and ask people about open access, and they won't understand. Ask them about open source, and many of them will. So we have 20 years to catch up, and we should be talking to people out there as well as people in there. And then, if you see the bottom paragraph here, um, we are sharing the learning of the rich with the poor, very poorly. We are sharing the poor with the rich not at all. So this is not a dialogue. This is a uh, northwestern um, a process at the moment, and we must change that, and the world must be involved in making something different happen. A common quest uh, for knowledge. So, phrase, I, I'm going to look backwards, 50 years. Uh, I'm a bit older than that, but I'm going to look back at least that uh, far. And one of the phrases that was very strong uh, then was the military-industrial-academic conflict. The idea that the system was out of control, that between defense industry, uh, between um, uh, the Department of Defense uh, and academia, in many cases, the system was being run in a way that government couldn't control. Uh, government couldn't control it, nor could anybody else. So I've taken that uh, and come up with a phrase, the publisher academic complex. And that, I think, is what we have at the moment, that this system uh, where publishers and academics are in an implicit relationship uh, is uh, running for the benefit of firms and not for the benefit of humanity in general. So taxpayers and students particularly put money into the system. They pay fees, and some of those fees goes to commercial publishers. Think about that, right? How many undergraduates are there here? Right, there should be more because you are the most important people in the room, and I'm serious here. Because you have even more freedom uh, than do uh, the postgraduates and early career researchers here. Let's take the message down to people who are really hit by this in the pocket, and that includes uh, undergraduates. Huge amounts of money given to publishers, and what do we get back? We get that glory for academia. That is the prime deliverable from the current publishing system. Now I'm simplifying because you have to simplify. These are not um, uh, scientific statements, they're political statements. These are the figures. Half a trillion dollars is spent on publicly funded research. And of that, uh, probably $15 billion goes to uh, publishing. We have a terrible gearing here, that this money is now uh, more and more controlled by the publishers. Most of that wealth is not uh, realized, and the opportunity cost of this is huge. The opportunity cost is probably several times that 400 
billion dollars. That is the work that is not done because we're not allowed to do it. I'll come to my own area in a minute, which is um, content mining. We are forbidden to do it by the publishers. That is an enormous amount of opportunity cost. So, and it's not just me. The Vice Chancellor of Cambridge, a um, respected bioscientist, has said in open data, and we need to look at open data as well as um, open access, Elsevier is looking at ways in which it can control open data as a private. His words, not mine. That frightens the hell out of me, and it should frighten the hell out of you. The publishers have tried to stop us making things open. Ross, uh, who you've already heard, did a brilliant job in going to Brussels and telling the publishers what we believe, what our rights were, and Ross won on points. You only win on points. There are no knockouts with publishers. Not yet. Uh, you win on points, and you keep winning on points. And this is the sort of thinking. How can we, in 2014, justify this? That a paper on Ebola is forbidden to 99% of the world. Uh, that should make people extremely angry. Now, when people are angry, uh, they suddenly get to a state where they can't take any more. And I'm going back 50 years, because this influenced much of my life. In the, fifth, in the 60s, we had the student revolution throughout the world, starting at Berkeley. And in Berkeley, you can see they flipped. And here's the student. We are not to be treated as raw materials. We are not to be bought by the university. There's a time when the whole system becomes so odious that you've got to stop it happening, right? Uh, and that started uh, the free speech movement in Berkeley. If you go to Berkeley, go to the Free Speech Cafe and, and read the documents about the students in the 1960s and their battles with the university, which they won. And that was my background. Uh, in the 1970s, <laughs> universities in the UK, to a large amount, uh, the students started to assert their rights. Up till then, uh, you know, their rights were very unclear. Uh, I was a young university lecturer at Stirling, that's a picture of Stirling, a beautiful place, and we had protests and sit-ins, uh, and I took, the I, I took the side of the students. Uh, that, by the way, is me, if you haven't guessed. Uh, uh, and much of it was on the idea that non-violence, but concerted, massive action could change the world. And here is... Um, uh, uh, oh my goodness, I've forgotten it. Right, flower power. Uh, right. So this is um, uh, flower power, which had a big impact on our generation. Yeah, and here is my flower power, my flower point, uh, which I will... Uh, uh, and that's me, Aphra, paying my homage uh, to the freedom movement, uh, you know, of much of my formative years. So here we are, open scholarship with all the mechanisms, and that was uh, uh, that was flower point at birth. Sorry. Right. I don't need to explain this slide, but I will uh, read just this little bit. We won this fight because everyone made themselves the hero of their own story. Everyone took it as their job to save this crucial freedom. It's about freedom. Now, this is Aaron's father, and parents don't always see things in a completely objective light. But I think that there is a case to say that the university system let down uh, Aaron's generation uh, and has not supported the freedoms that we need in our battle against um, uh, the digital dark age. We are in the digital enlightenment, and we have to fight to make sure that enlightenment uh, survives. Now, this is John writing yesterday. This is an incredibly brave and a very, very uh, convincing uh, blog post, and you should read it, right? Uh, this is in the tradition of Aaron. It's in the tradition of uh, Berkeley, it is saying we have fundamental rights and we have come to a stage where we've got to decide uh, how we're going to take things. And it's we meaning the young people who are tired 
uh, of this. The near criminal business. I mean, that is absolutely the, um, uh, the academic publisher complex. Uh, that is the problem. In the day. And by the way, John might uh, need feeding at some stage by his book. It's brilliant, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <clears throat> there is a strong tradition in this country and many others of challenging unjust laws. Uh, this uh, is back in the 1930s when it was illegal to go on the hills and mountains of England, less so Scotland, <coughs> because the law said you couldn't trespass. And workers uh, decided to challenge this by mass trespass on Kinder Scout in uh, the Derbyshire Peaks. And they used the phrase, the right to roam. You enjoy that right to roam because these people uh, deliberately trespassed on um, the hills which they felt were their right uh, and uh, that the law wasn't giving them that right. And I've taken that uh, and used it in my phrase here, uh, the right to read is the right to mine. And I would argue that slogans of this sort are valuable for your cause. You want to get your ideas over quickly. And um, I'm very pleased that this phrase, uh, the right to read is the right to mine, has taken off. Now what that means is that, first of all, I think we have a right to read anyway, and we've heard this already, but if you have a right to read something, you have a right to use machines to help you and others read it. And the publishers, I'm using this word uh, in a political sense, but many of the publishers are doing their best to stop me and others using machines to read the literature simply because it's impacting on their business. There is no other technical or political or educational or social reason for stopping people using machines uh, to read the literature. So that's my particular fight. But I will fight your fight as well. And if you go to the barricades, I will be there. So here are our young people again. And I particularly want to pick Sophie. Sophie is a fourth year undergraduate at Oxford. Um, and uh, sorry, graduate, a fourth year graduate student in computational bioscience. Uh, uh, Sophie's also becoming a mother at the moment, so, um, uh, you know, she's not a lot on her plate, but she has developed an open science training course uh, where she is training, as a third year graduate student, she's training first year graduate students in all the problems that she had when she was a first year graduate student. That's the feedback loop that you want to build. You, as third-year graduate students, should be training your first-year uh, entrants because you understand the problems with missing data. You understand uh, the uh, angst you have to go through in getting things published and so on. So I think that training is one of the major models that you can embrace uh, for, um, uh, for helping to change the world in a non-violent fashion. So, here are some of the things that you can do uh, to change the world. Um, write software. I write what I call liberation software. I don't write software for glory, and I don't write software for academic papers. I have that luxury. I am very, very fortunate that I don't have to worry about my age index, which is bloody awful at the moment, and won't get any better. But, um, and I'm proud of that. Uh, so, um, Build software, build community, build protocols, evangelize, build materials. Training, I think, is particularly important. And build things that spread virally. If you can do all that, you will change the world, we will change the world, and nobody uh, can stop that process. I'm going to pick one example. Uh, who recognizes uh, where this map came from? Nobody. Where's it come from? Open street map. That was started by one person, Steve Coach, uh, and he had he had major problems with the UK Ordnance Survey, which owns not only the maps in this country, but the right to use those maps. Uh, and uh, he challenged this by building a map of the world, uh, and he and his colleagues have done that. I have contributed to OpenStreetMap. And uh, something like 
500,000 volunteers have contributed to OpenStreetMap to build a completely open map of the world. And that is the map that is used in humanitarian disasters uh, such as Haiti, such as uh, Fukushima, such as uh, Christchurch, and so on. OpenStreetMap volunteers can map the world faster than anybody else. Uh, and that's a magnificent achievement, particularly since I think for the first few years they didn't even have a bank account. So, uh, what I'm doing at the moment with several of the people in this room is to build a system completely open which is going to liberate uh, 100 million facts from the scientific literature. We've won the right in this country to mine facts despite major fight from the publishers. Uh, and the way that we're going to do it is to build community, to build open software, and you are more than welcome uh, to join us. We'd love you to join us um, in this. And this is my last slide. I've just <coughs> put down here some of the people, uh, very few random people who have um, inspired me. Uh, at the top of the list is Open Access Button because they are going to change the world. I want to just mention Rainer and uh, Pierre Carl because they have had the bravery to go out in the French media and challenge Elsevier and get secret documents uh, that uh, Elsevier had with the libraries and publish it in Le Monde and get a big news story and they deserve considerable uh, congratulations for that. I won't go through the rest but I am just going to come back to, um, um, I mentioned briefly um, John Bradley, uh, who took um, the view that all science should be published as it was done, literally within minutes, right? I don't have time to tell you about that, but he brought in undergraduates to do this research. Um, and that, I think, is a real model. If you can take this model down to your juniors uh, in years uh, and get them involved, that is not only a way of spreading the message, but actually uh, changing the world. So I finally just want to mention uh, Sophie. Sophie has developed a course for computational um, uh, procedures in uh, for, for uh, graduates. It's open. It's the sort of thing which could spread very easily in a viral manner. And any of you who want to get your ideas uh, spread, training is potentially a very good way to do it. So talk to uh, the people responsible for training. If there isn't any training, offer to do it. You already have this. Sophie is in Oxford. Oxford got some kudos. Uh, and you know you can make the case that young people care about this and can change the world. on yourselves uh, that some revolutions happen very rapidly. Uh, the software revolution has taken about 15 years before it went from completely closed to uh, Stallman and Torvalds uh, and so on. The web revolution has probably taken about the same sort of thing. My worry about the academic system is the academic system trains young people to think in an old manner. They institutionalize them very quickly. And this could become self-perpetuating. So my worst nightmare is that we will never get there because the system will become more powerful than the individuals. Um, that's a dystopian view. I, on the other hand, um, you know, there are people who have managed to change the world in five years or more. I, I'd say, Hopefully 10, aim for 10, that you have a complete change and you really honour the Budapest uh, Open Access Declaration. Yeah, my question is really provocative and is somehow connected to what you already said. Good, I'm how, glad. How can, we, how can you say to us to change the world? Well, I don't feel I belong to the group of the undergraduates at all, but especially for the undergraduates or the postgraduate, 
how they cannot sustain such a system if they need to publish on journals, get a input factor numbers in order to proceed to their career. Then we they are then we defeating the system in this way. How can we disrupt this? I'm afraid I can't answer that for you. I can give the historical context and I can help to mentor people if they feel that they have a way to change it. But I can't say to you, go and lie down in front of the gates of Imperial College um, and so on. If on the other hand you say, we are so uh, frustrated that we want to carry out a mass protest <coughs> of some sort, then I'm happy to give you advice. So I can't tell you what to do or when to do it, but I can um, uh, try and give you some advice on how to do it. You know, you may say, our generation doesn't actually want to rock the boat too much because of whatever we want. Smooth transition is more important than discontinuity. The Berkeley students just got fed up and said, we have had enough and we are going to change the system, and they did. So that's why I can't, I'm not offering out of it. I just can't go to see your question. So you mentioned that the publishers don't like content money and it's an effect on business revenue. But another thing that gets affected by mining is a large number of requests and they need to expand their infrastructure in order to post all of this information and all of this data and stuff. And so if we do move towards a more open model, what kind of funding structures do you see to actually post all of this data and to allow people to mine it? Is it going to be like a Jimmy Rails Wikipedia thing every year? Or? So, I'm interested. Uh, have you been told by somebody that content mining will burn all those servers out on the publishers? Or have you no, 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 hypothesized no, no, no. it? I'm just hypothesizing. Okay. I, right. I can read the whole literature on my laptop every day. Uh, and I need no more resources. One request per paper. It is about 10 to the minus 6 of the requests that the publisher gets in a day. Cameron Nalen ha has put all this out. The yeah, problem... There, what? There's a really good quote from Cameron Nalen. Yeah. But, um, he's a floss, right? So he's, a, he's in charge of floss so statistics and stuff. And um, you know, text miners cause you know, almost no birth on floss servers. But when an article gets really popular on Reddit or something like that and social media, that's when they really feel the yeah. pain. And if an article gets really popular on Reddit, then they start actually getting server pain. And uh, you know, that's just a kind of misconception about the text mining is out there. Yes, this is the publishers promote that view, and it's what's called have you heard of FUD? <laughs> Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And that's one of the main things that people who are in a defensive position do. Uh, so they say, oh, it's going to burn our servers out. Oh, uh, we won't be able to do this. Right, okay, and uh, and so forth. It's pure fun. Well, what about the other side of that? In the whole infrastructure that we're posting all the data, if all of this becomes open, we love paper, and there's no more It's the amount of data that uh, is in the whole of the published literature per year would fit on anybody's hard disk. It's less than a terabyte, isn't it, Ross? Yeah. Exactly. Who will pay? Would it be the 
is ultimately for the end of the independence. There may be governments that sponsor certain data that they can do, but you're right, I mean, it's not, it's not coming for free. It will have to be done, but that's that's it. And the other thing I want to say was that we've got a, a book chapter coming out on responsible tech and data mining. So I would say if you're being an irresponsible consumer, <coughs> yes, you could <laughs> hammer, a, hammer a publisher's service, but you have to be pretty. Cool. Like I was at Europe from that central meeting, and um, the person who was demoing Europe from that central, it was really, really slow during the demo, and it was because some irresponsible researcher was hitting them in 2020 seconds um, on their service. And, that, and that's bad research. That is, that is not publishers not being able to cope, it's just that you know, they're not being responsible. And that would be it's it's good to be responsible because then you don't bring that service. So actually the researchers don't want to do that either. The researchers are actually working to cooperate on general moderating their requests to ensure the resource that goes down. Because if the resource goes down then they can't do their research. So actually it's kind of self moderating the data. I think we've got time for maybe one more question. So you were referring to Armstrong, and I was wondering if you can elaborate on how to carry on his work without either without having the same like uh, problem with the law. Or do you think that carrying on his work means having to work on the So I'm very interested and surprised that so little has followed out of Aaron's work and, and so on. Um, the first thing is that it doesn't seem to have set alight a tradition, although you know um, some people have suggested that, that it should. Um, I'm not going to call Aaron a martyr, but he's undoubtedly a, you know, about the most uh, uh, significant role model you know, that, that we've got. Um, and there was no doubt that there was major injustice in what happened, and that makes uh, a lot of people very angry. So that is one thing, examine uh, what happened and whether it is tolerable or not. Why Aaron was doing it, nobody except uh, Larry Lessig uh, uh, knows, I think. Um, he had a motive, uh, we believe. Why he did it in the way that he did, I don't know. He wasn't as far as I know, going to take the whole of JSTOR and stick it out uh, for the world. He wanted to use JSTOR for some purpose, um, and I'm not quite sure what it was, but it was, uh, you know, again, to fight for some form of um, uh, justice or um, investigation or whatever. Uh, you know, where, as I say, in the in the 60s, there were songs of freedom. Uh, there was, you know, the Ballad of Joe Hill, uh, which Jerome Bayer sang at um, that meeting uh, there. There isn't a Ballad of Aaron Schwartz, right? Maybe there should be. On that note, <laughs>